Okay. Welcome everybody back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight uh, we're going to talk about miracles. So the, the word for tonight, as usual, we have a word. The word for tonight is uh, Vikurvanya. Vikurvanya. And that's a word that's going to be translated as a miracle. But of, as usual, we're going to, you know, complicate that a little bit. So tonight is sort of a continuation of last Sunday. So last Sunday, we were talking about the Siddhis. And the Siddhis are the supernatural powers. And so actually, um, I didn't intend for last week's talk to, to go so long on the old school, early Buddhist um, approach to the supernatural powers. So we didn't get all the way to where I wanted, which is okay, of course. So I decided to give it a new topic tonight, though. And so we're going to talk specifically about this idea of Vikurvanya. But what's interesting, or what we're going to figure out, and I'll just tell you this from the beginning, what makes this interesting, this idea of a miracle, specifically, by the way, a Vikurvanya is a miraculous transformation. And that, that's going to have a few different, um, well, I, I'm going to give you a bunch of different examples of these miraculous transformations, and you'll see that they kind of cover a, a wide range of activity. Um, but here's the thing about tonight's topic versus last week's topic. Last week's topic, we were talking about being a meditator and meditating and then through the process of that, of yoga in that sense, we talked about someone developing supernatural powers, maybe using those powers, maybe not using them, and what those different powers are. So last week was about someone developing these supernatural powers and displaying them. The way that you can think about tonight, and I think it'll be a good... Um, uh, kind of just to point point it where this is going this evening. Tonight, the Vikarvanya is it's kind of about being witness to a Siddhi. And what so what I mean by that is is that a Vikarvanya, it it's sort of about witnessing a miracle, witnessing somebody do something amazing. So it's on the, the, the witness side of this versus the side of it of the person performing the miracle. So that's how last week and this week are going to kind of come together because we're going to be still talking in a way about displaying supernatural power. But then we want to be focusing tonight on the idea of being on the sort of on the receiving end of, of that. So. As usual, I tried to do some etymological research on this word, Vikravanya. I want you to know it, it is an older Pali word, or it comes from an older Pali word, uh, Vikubana, Vikubana, V I K U B B A N A. So it's the same word, just that, that southern pronunciation, which is the Pali language is a Southern Indian language that just pronounces the words a little differently. I tried digging into this word and I couldn't find much about it etymologically speaking in terms of like, what are, what is the V kurva nya? <laughs> like what, what's going on in those syllables in those words? I couldn't find any etymology. All I could find was the use, the, the way that the word is used it has kind of a kind of a limited use in the Pali, but again, it is an old word, it's an old idea. And so I want to begin tonight by sharing with you sort of the oldest, most original uh, occurrence of a Vikurvanya. 
of a miracle. And this is something that is usually called the twin miracle at Shravasti. So Shravasti is, of course, one of those um, viharas. It's one of the locations where the Buddha would hang out. Um, if you know your kind of early Buddhist history, you'll know that there were these kind of different locales that the Buddha would kind of stop at for a while, teach for a while, and then move to different areas. But there were different locales where he stayed often. One of those locales was a, a mango grove uh, called the Jetavana, sometimes also called Anathapindika's Park. And that is in a place called Shravasti. So there is something that's called the twin miracle at Shravasti. And what happens is, and I, I want to remind everybody as we ease into this tonight, what I'm about to tell you is a old Buddhist miracle tale. This is not some you know, Mahayana mumbo jumbo craziness from some sutra in that way. This is a, a very old part of the Buddhist tradition. And not only that, I want you to know this miracle that I'm about to describe, it not only is it considered a miracle of the Buddha from the original tradition, it's part of a larger idea about Buddhas plural. And you may know, of course, that there were Buddhas before Siddhartha, so before, before our Buddha. And what the Buddha says about this miracle is that, oh yeah, all Buddhas have to perform this miracle. So that's interesting. Well, what is the miracle? Well, as it occurs in the story, there were a group of um, like rival, uh, like a rival gang of philosophers. They were, they're considered these, um, <clears throat> excuse me, six, six heretical teachers, these six heretical philosophers. And they had challenged the Buddha to like a debate. And this is, ha this happens a lot where people challenge the Buddha to a debate or there are just these philosophical kind of um, philosophical debates. But we are to understand, like if you, if you, you know, kind of dig into the culture and the history, we are to understand that there was a lot at stake in these debates because the way it seems to have played out is that you'd have two teachers and they would have groups of followers. And depending upon who won the debate, all the other person's followers would go with that other person because the other person lost the, the debate. Why would you want to study with, with that person when th this person's clearly smarter? So, so these debates were sort of important. And they were also important too, by the way, because if you won a debate, you would probably become notable and receive more offerings for you and your group. So there was a, a lot, a lot riding on these debates. And this was a particular uh, uh, event, a particular moment where all six of these heretical philosophers challenged the Buddha to a debate. And the debate goes down at Shravasti and basically, oh, I got to tell you too, because you might, someone who mentioned this recently at, in a Dharma doors, this is actually all part of a larger story about a monk named Pindula. And Pindula, um, there was a, this is like a story within a story now, but so there was this um, wealthy person, I think that made a challenge. They put a flag way up on a pole and they challenged and said, whoever can kind of get the flag, I'll give all this money to. And this monk, Pindala, used his siddhis. He used his supernatural powers to fly up and grab the flag. And afterwards, word got back to the Buddha 
And the Buddha told Pindala, like, you really shouldn't have done that. And he was like, oh, but I had the best interest of the Sangha in mind because I was going to use the money from the challenge. I was going to use the money for the, for the Sangha. And the Buddha was still like, yeah, you really shouldn't have displayed your supernatural powers like that. So this sort of is a catalyst for this big debate about the Buddha. And it goes down at Shravasti. And there's a number of components to this miracle. The one component, and I got to tell you, it's, it's where it gets its name, the twin miracle at Shravasti. The, the twin is not a, like a, a, a Siamese twin or like a, a that. It's actually a reference to this thing that happened where the Buddha spews water and fire out of his body. They say that he spewed fire out of the upper part of his body and water out of the lower part of his body, but then began to spew the opposite, so water and fire. And then the way they describe this miracle is this sort of um, some kind of magical vortex starts to form out of the alternating spewing of fire and water. And in the kind of the, you know, it always, I, I've said this before, whenever I hear this tale of this miracle, it always reminds me of the, the rainbows that you see when you spray like a hose and you can begin to see the rainbows in that, and it's the light reflecting off the water. Well, de they describe this alternating fire and water becoming kind of like a rainbow, and out of the rainbow, there emerge these emanations, little Buddhas. Like, and part of the story is that these emanations, these like other versions of the Buddha, they each debate one of the six philosophers. And so the, the miracle is sort of about the Buddha becoming six different people and debating each philosopher at the same time using a different logic or a different rhetoric in that way. And then my, my, my favorite part of this story is the, the philosophers, the six heretical philosophers, they are absolutely blown away by this fire, water, miracle thing that they're speechless. They, they can't even respond to these miraculously produced emanations of the Buddha. And so the emanations emanate Buddhas themselves and debate each other <laughs> for the benefit of the audience. And so they're all giving these sort of uh, philosophical demonstrations. <laughs> and so, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's kind of humorous. One does have to wonder what they are talking about, like what they're describing in that way. By the way, also part of this miracle is the Buddha creating a kind of a rainbow bridge and walking in the air, kind of levitating, but also walking on this kind of rainbow bridge that he has also sort of emanated out of all of this mirac miraculous stuff. Now, everything I just told you about the twin miracle at Shravasti, it's a Vikravanya. It is a miraculous transformation, but kind of what makes it a Vikravanya is that it, it's about the reaction of the audience. It's about the reaction of these other philosophers. And, and basically these other philosophers, you know, at the end of the story, they, they bow to the Buddha. And so the miracle is about the what i'm getting at is is that 
they call these vikravanyas, they call them miraculous transformations, but it's not entirely clear whether the transformation is about these uh, displays of the Buddha or if the transformation is the person witnessing them and then being converted, so to speak, being transformed into a Buddhist believer. Or maybe it's both of those. It's the idea that the transformation causes a transformation in that way. So just want you to know that that's the kind of original, like, or, you know, one of the older uses of this idea of a vikur vanya, all right? By the way, there's a number of miracles that the Buddha performs and these are all miracles that are part of the early Buddhist tradition. So I'm, I'm, I want to establish that this tradition of the Vikarvanya is already there. It's already part of sort of the Buddhist tradition in that way. Um, any, any questions about just about that kind of introduction about the twin miracle, miracles in general, I mean, kind of like, Again, I want to leave it really, you know, wide open in terms of like, what do, what do these things mean? You know, um, I didn't, I don't want to go, you know, too deep into um, like a comparative conversation, but of course we're familiar with other religious traditions where the founder of that religious tradition performs miracles, right? This is not uh, unique to Buddhism. So you know, one sometimes wonders then, what are they talking about? What happened? Did the Buddha literally spew fire and water out of his body? Or is that some sort of a metaphor for something? Um, you know, you take a, the, you take the phenomena of multiplying one's body, right? Again, are we talking literally? Or is that, is that kind of um, figurative in some sense that the Buddha split his body in that way? Um, we don't know. And I kind of not exactly sure that we're supposed to, you know, be so certain about what it means in that way. So, um, oh, by the way, I, and I mentioned too that the miracle at Shravasti as well as a number of these other miracles that the Buddha performs, they're all part of this, this, uh, this lore, a mythology, it would be called a Buddhology, but it, this Buddhology that these miracles, that every, all Buddhas perform these miracles at some point in their kind of teaching career in that way. So what I wanna do now then is begin to transition back to the sutra that we've been reading and we're going to see another miracle but before we read or look at that miracle i kind of want to remind you of a few other things um i think the one thing that i want to remind everybody of and i know this is going to be a little bit of a digression but just to, just a brief one and it has to do with these uh, sutras. It has to do with these texts that we're reading, that we always read on Sunday nights. So I know that most of you are already very familiar with in, the general uh, makeup of the Buddhist canon, but let me just kind of, you know, say something, repeat something. So the suttas, as they're called, in Sanskrit, the sutras, right? So you all are very familiar, I'm sure, with that there's this body of writings called the Pali Canon. And there's in the Pali Canon, in this language called Pali, there are a bunch of suttas, as they're called, sutras in Sanskrit. And I want to kind of remind everybody of something that doesn't kind of get mentioned enough. And it's that all these sutras, and I'm not going to go and get my big stack of books and show everybody that I, I always do, but I want to remind everybody that the word sutta or sutra, sutra 
means to stitch together. It's literally what sutra means in the English word suture, like to stitch up a wound, comes from that Sanskrit word sutra. And well, what's, what's being stitched together? Well, the idea is, is that what a sutra is, is a collection of sayings. And those sayings could be on a number of different topics. So you might be familiar with, of course, the famous Kama Sutra, not a Buddhist sutra, but what the Kama Sutra is, is a bunch of things that people have said about Kama, sensual pleasure. And so so-and-so over there said something about sensual pleasure. A really good way to maximize sensual pleasure is to do this. Oh, that's a great idea. There one over here. Oh, that's a great idea. That's a great idea too. Oh, that's interesting. And pretty soon we gather together all of these sayings, all of these pieces of information about a topic, stitch them together, and you've got a sutra. So that word, that idea of stitching together, it goes for Buddhist sutras too. What I'm getting at is, is that someone like me, for example, I, I do believe in a historical person that we call the Buddha. Like I have read enough sutras of the Pali canon, of the early canon, and I'm pretty convinced that that's all from the mind of one person. There's, you read enough of them and you just start to get a sense that, oh yeah, this was a person. This was a person that spoke a certain way, had a certain sense of humor even, was certainly wise in de definitive ways. But the idea is, is that that person that we call the Buddha said a bunch of stuff. And later on, the monks got together and stitched together all of the different things the Buddha said. And what I mean is, is that a sutra, even a sutta, meaning a Pali sutta, these things have always been constructed. They've always been, meaning, yeah, they've always been constructed in that way. And the thing about it is, is, and it's what I love about these sutras, they are cognizant of the fact that they are stories in that way, because they all begin with this idea of thus have I heard. And the idea is, is that what you are about to read, what you're about to hear, the sutra is letting you know you're about to hear a story. You're not, you're, you are not about to hear the words of the Buddha. You're about to hear what somebody says they heard the Buddha say. It tells you that from the beginning, which is a very interesting uh, concession, as it were, in the, in the beginning. So what I'm getting around at, with, and I don't want to belabor this too long, but I just want you to know that even though the words, the sayings of the early Buddhist canon are most likely the words of the, the Buddha, their structure, the way they were put together, the order in which they were put together, the, the grouping, that's all a later kind of construction. And, and there are these... Um, these tro tropes, if you will, the trope is the best word for it, but these kind of these uh, recurring themes in the sutras, um, not just the thus have I heard one time, but there's even internal things that get repeated. And ultimately, in, in the end, what I'm getting at is that a, a Buddhist sutta from the earliest days was already a kind of a book by which I mean a narrative construction. And it's it, it sort of, I feel like it misses something important if you are 
only looking at suttas as records of what the Buddha said and missing that you it's a it's a constructed story in that sense yeah tanya yeah I mean, and, you know i was just thinking as you said that i mean the the order in which they put things is even gonna influence like how you read it yep you can know, you, you say <clears throat> you know you're if, if you read it from one end to the other which maybe most i don't know how often people do that i mean if they if they just skip around but right yeah and you know another thing too is I've, I've also mentioned this, this is, um, you know, a very funny, a very funny thing about sutras. And this is also, again, from the early Buddhist tradition. So I've often mentioned that if you read all the suttas, sometimes the Buddha's in Shravasti, you know, sometimes he's in, in all these different places. And in the early days, in the early days of Buddhist scholarship in Europe and in, uh, in America, somebody had the brilliant idea of going through all the suttas and recording. Every time the Buddha was at Shravasti, every time the Buddha was at this place, every time the Buddha was at that place, and then used other sources and people constructed a like a biography of the buddha like the tract like oh you know the entire 45 years of his life and oh then he must have been here because he was at shravasti all the time but then he was at here so that must have happened here and so they construct a whole biography of the buddha based upon where each of the suttas was taught and then something happened they discovered, scholars discovered a manual, and it was a manual for reciters of sutras. So there's particular, um, uh, like almost a profession, a, vo a vocation in that sense, where certain monks would be reciters, and they would recite 80 years old at his death, yep, 35 enlightened at 35, died at 45. So there's this manual that talks about reciters and the proper, it's like things about like, uh, you know, a lot of things like even things that you're not supposed to eat before you recite sutras and like about not making your breath stink because you don't want to taint the Dharma when you're teaching the sutras and things like that. So interesting manual about do the do's and don'ts the do's and don'ts of reciting sutras and you know what there was one thing in that manual that was very interesting and it said if you ever can't remember where the sutra was taught you can always say it was taught at shravasti so isn't it funny that those historians I told you about that constructed the biography of the Buddha based upon the sutras, you know what they determined? That the Buddha taught at Shravasti more times than any other place. Now, did he teach in Shravasti more times than any other place? Or did monks just keep forgetting where the sutras took place? And so they kept ascribing it to Shravasti until eventually that became the most cited place for a sutra to happen. My point is, is that a, re a revelation like that, a little nugget like that, that points and says, oh yeah, and by the way, where this sutra takes place is not actually relevant to its message. So if you can't remember where it takes place, that's really not important here. So Right there, I want, it's like a window into a whole world. And I want you to kind of recognize that even in the early Buddhist tradition, in this kind of very conservative, you know, monastic world, in those suttas, 
the location, like where the sutra takes place, it's already kind of fictitious. Yeah, I mean, it's Shravasti is like a real place. But what I mean is, is that in the telling of this sutra, the fact that it took place in Shravasti is just a, it's just part of the story. And so what I'm getting at is, is that this has basically been a very long way of saying that a Mahayana Sutra, like we're reading tonight, where the location of this Sutra is like, you know, I don't even know what world system this Sutra is taking place in anymore. Are we on this planet? Are we on Manjushri's future Buddha land planet? There's a way in which that kind of uh, pl playing with the location of the sutra, it's sort of not that different than the early suttas. I think the, the early suttas were a little more, not con they were conservative in that way. So they're a little more tame. They're not gonna talk about a sutra taking place on another planet for example, they're going to keep it within the realm of Shravasti or Nalanda or somewhere reasonable. But my point is, is that the, these Mahayana sutras that get a little, or not a little, they get very narrative, very story-like. I don't think that that's actually that far away from the early suttas. Like I'm, what I'm saying is I think the early suttas actually opened up the possibility for the later sutras because they were already somewhat fictionalized and narrativized and, and so on. So apologies if that was boring to anybody, but just wanted to share that idea. Um, and that was actually to plant a major seed regarding the location, the location of a sutra, like where it's taking place, all right? Okay, before we dive into our sutra and our miracle, I wanna now transition just a little bit to a Mahayana sutra. And I wanna remind you of what, well, I wanna remind you of some Vikravanya that you, that you might already be familiar with. So a, a really good place to go to, uh, to witness some miracles is a really great sutra called the Vimalakirti Sutra. So I'm always talking about Vimalakirti, of course. Um, I taught or, you know, at the SFDC a course on Vimalakirti a long time ago. So in that wonderful Mahayana Sutra, it is known for having a number of miracles. And I'm not going to dwell too long on the Vimalakirti, but I do want to just reference one. It happens at the very beginning of that sutra. And so in that sutra, which takes place in Vaishali, so that's where that sutra takes place. And in Vaishali, there were these 500 um, uh, sons of elders, but they were like wealthy, 500 wealthy uh, men from the city of Vaishali. And they all showed up after the Buddha had um, kind of settled into a situation in Vaishali. All these 500 uh, dudes show up and they all have these little umbrellas, uh, parasols, and they offer them, they, they present them as offerings to, to the Buddha. And then the Buddha performs a miracle. And that miracle is that he transforms, so it's a miraculous transformation. He transforms all 500 of these little umbrellas into one giant umbrella that covers the entire city of Vaishali. But not only that, everybody in Vaishali it is, it can now look up into the 
underside of the umbrella because they're covered by this umbrella and in the underside of the umbrella they can see the entire universe like they all all of a sudden have the divine eye and can see the entire 3000 great thousand world system all in the umbrella and it's such a miracle that many many people of vaishali uh, generate bodhicitta right they 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 generate uh, the mind of a bodhisattva and then again that's just one miracle among many that happen in that in that sutra but here's the thing about it are we to think are we to understand that in 500 bc in india in a place called vaishali are, are we to understand from the Vimalakirti Sutra that this thing happened, an event happened, where 500 people showed up with little umbrellas and the Buddha actually can turn them all into one giant umbrella and everybody could see the universe in the bottom of it? <clears throat> like, is that what we're to understand? Like, that is that what the Vimalakirti Sutra is telling us? <clears throat> now, it is telling us that in, in a narrative fashion, it is saying that in the life of the Buddha, this event happened. But of course, I think you would be very misled to read the Vimalakirti as a historical document about a, a historical event. I don't think that the Vimalakirti Sutra is trying to impress you, the reader, with something that happened in the past. So that leads us to my thesis which is that a miracle like that, a miracle like in the Vimalakirti Sutra, the miracle is the story of 500 elder, sons of elders uh, gifting the Buddha these umbrellas and him transforming them into one umbrella. And there's a lot actually that I could unpack in that story. What I mean is, is that the parasol the umbrella is symbolic in the world of Buddhism. It has deep, deep symbolism. One of the things that it symbolizes among many things, by the way, but one of the main things it symbolizes a, an umbrella is refuge, a kind of uh, security, a kind of safety in that way. And so one way to read the miracle that I just described of the umbrellas, one way that you could read that is a bunch of disparate people who all had little houses of their own, little uh, either uh, sources of wealth sources of whatever it is, but these little disparate people who all individually had their own situation that was protecting them come together, making offerings to the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, and that miraculously transforms their collective wealth, their collective efforts into one refuge for the entire city of Vaishali. Now, if 500 wealthy people pool, pooled all their money together to kind of unite and then use their collective wealth and collective everything to protect an entire city, yeah, that would be a miracle. So what I'm getting at is, is that like, I think that if you start to think about these things a little too literally, even the fire and water, like if you get a little distracted by this idea of fire and water, you might miss something in that, in that way. So 
of course, what I'm getting at is, is that these miracles, these Vikarvanyas that are like in the Vimalakirti Sutra, these are very different than the kind of the Siddhis that we were talking about last week. Because last week, the, the, the supernatural powers and all of that that we were talking about last week, last week we were kind of talking literally. Like, it, and I mean, we got it, we complicated it a little bit. And what I, what I, the reason, what I'm saying is, is that last week I said something to the effect of what's the difference between levitating and thinking you levitated? <laughs> Pretty fine line between the two, because if you th thought you levitated, well, you thought you levitated in both of those cases, <laughs> if, if you see my meaning. And so there's kind of a li very little difference between just thinking you did a miracle versus actually doing a miracle. But my point is, is that last week we were sort of basically talking about literal magic, but with, with, with some caveats in that way. Tonight, though, we're talking exclusively about these kind of, um, I don't know, a, a literary mir miracle, right? Where it's, it's like, it's a miracle in, the, in story form in that way. So I just kind of wanted to, to remind you that there's this tradition, not another tradition, but a a thing that goes on in Mahayana sutras where they talk a lot about these vikarvanyas, about these miracles, but it's really probably going to be helpful to remember that these are literature, stories. And so the miracle is going to be in the story, not trying to figure out a historical event and what are they twisting? What kind of historical event are they twisting into some miracle? Right. So, all right, are we doing okay with miracles so far and all of that? Awesome. Okay, so let's talk again about um, location. So, by the way, this could go for a lot of different things. I'm just decided for tonight, I'm gonna emphasize the idea of location. Where does the sutra take place? Right? Because like I said, in the old school suttas, thus have I heard, one time the Buddha was somewhere. Maybe it was Shravasti, maybe it wasn't, but he was somewhere and then something happened. So the sutra that we're reading, that we've been reading now for months, is this Man Manjushri's Pure Land Sutra or the prediction of Manjushri's enlightenment. And it's actually a very long sutra. I didn't quite realize how, well, like I said, I didn't realize how long it was because the version that we normally use is heavily redacted. So I didn't realize that the real sutra is quite a lot longer than the one that's in here. But it's not even so much that the sutra is so long. It's very, what's a good word, right? Circuitous. It's circuitous. So what I mean is, is that the sutra begins, and I'm going to give you a very, very brief, quick summary. The sutra begins, and the Buddha is said to be hanging out on the vulture's peak, the Gridrakuta in Rajgriha. But the sutra is about the Buddha, who's in vulture's peak, going down into the city, the big city, into the capital, into Rajgriha. So right away at the beginning of this sutra, we're sort of like, whoa, wait, is the sutra taking place at the vulture's peak or is it taking place in the city? Like, what, what's exactly going on here? The Buddha then descends and goes into the city and gives a teaching a little teaching to a householder bodhisattva. 
And we are to understand that that, that teaching was for like city folk, householding city folk. And so it was a very, very specific teaching about householding in that way. But then the Buddha packs up his stuff and goes back to the vulture's peak. And on vulture's peak, he says, all right, now we're going to get into the real Dharma. So this is interesting already where we're like, whoa, whoa, what was that first part then? But before the Buddha can give the sutra and which we are to understand is like the real sutra on vulture's peak he says before i can do that this he says it's not it's not beautiful enough here and then in an, in a different version it says there's not enough people here and so the buddha emits a light and this is also a miracle we we have actually already encountered many miracles in the sutra already one of which was the Buddha emitting this light that is becomes visible throughout the universe, throughout the 3,000 great thousand world system. And this is where this sutra starts to get weird. And it's kind of the main reason I wanted to study it, study it with you and do it here on Dharma Doors. This really fun, interesting thing happens the story shifts to another Buddha land in some way far off region of the universe. And there's a, a, a bodhisattva there. And the bodhisattva sees this light. And so then asks the Buddha of that Buddha land, what's up with this light? And that Buddha tells the bodhisattva there, oh, that's Shakyamuni Buddha in the Saha world, the world of endurance over in that direction. And the bodhisattva asks like, wow, that bodhisattva must be pretty powerful to emit such a light that reaches all the way here. What's up with that, that Buddha there? And the Buddha begins to describe kind of how difficult things are in the Saha world. And the Bodhisattva in this other world, which is like a, an immaculately pure Buddha land, that Bodhisattva says, but a, a Buddha that powerful that could emit a light that bright that illuminates the entire universe, why would a Buddha that powerful be reborn in such a kind of defiled world when he could be reborn anywhere in the whole multiverse. And that Buddha says, oh, well, because Shakyamuni Buddha has such great compassion for all the beings of the Saha world. And that inspires the Bodhisattva. And that Bodhisattva says, well, I want to go to the Saha world. And the Buddha there says, oh, I don't know if you will want to go to the the Saha world, because people there can be a little angry, and a little not too nice. And the Bodhisattva sit in that Buddha land says, but that's exactly why I want to go to practice patience among all of these people in the Saha world. And the Buddha then says, well, if you think the time's right to go, why don't you go? And a bunch of other Bodhisattvas from that world all come to the Saha world. And the same thing happens in the East, in the West, in the North, in the South. And so pretty soon, eventually, all these bodhisattvas from all of these other realms come to this Saha world to hear the Buddha preach a sutra. So right there, it's again, it's like, wait, where are we? Where, where's this sutra taking place again? It, it, it gets so kind of wild in that way. Okay, so now all of these bodhisattvas from all of these other regions are on the vulture's peak. And the Buddha says like, all right, now we can teach the Dharma. And then proceeds to give a very long teaching to the monk Shariputra. And the Buddha gives, and I would say now like, 
having studied the sutra with you all here, we, we're not done with the, the whole sutra yet, but the teaching to Shariputra that was like the bulk of the middle of the sutra does seem to be the like the Dharma teaching. And er, all the miracles on either side of it at the beginning and afterwards, I don't want to say that they're just kind of decorations for the teaching. They're, they're truly, you know, illustrative or illustrative of, of the ideas. But the, the discourse between the Buddha and Shariputra is all about the Bodhisattva path. In particular, it's about the idea of Bodhisattvas adorning their Buddha lands with arrays of virtues. That's the, like, you know, to put it short, how do you purify a Buddha land? How do you purify a mind state? How do you purify a world? The Buddha gives a bunch of different teachings to Shariputra about uh, beautifying or purifying one's Buddha land. After that, a bodhisattva pipes up named this uh, thunderous lion courage or something like that. Powerful lion courage, bodhisattva. And this bodhisattva wants to know, well, what's Manjushri's Buddha land going to be like? Now, Manjushri, of course, is the star of the sutra, this, you know, very kind of well-known bodhisattva. And <clears throat> this dialogue starts to happen between this young bodhisattva named Lion Courage and then this kind of veteran bodhisattva Manjushri. And there's a bit of back and forth in all of that that's very interesting. You can go back and kind of watch the other episodes if you hadn't seen that. But then what happens is, is that we start to get another weird thing start to happen. And what that weird thing is, is that, well, first of all, when the Bodhisattva Lion Courage asks Manjushri about what his Buddha land is going to be like, like in the future, Manjushri sort of has a problem with the very way that that question is phrased. And ultimately, it's about this idea of emptiness and no self, and him saying, well, if the self is empty and all is empty, then what self is there to attain a Buddha land in some future time? So I don't really know what you're talking about, Lion Courage. And so there's some kind of interesting philosophical uh, discourse that happens between the, uh, the Bodhisattvas. But eventually the Buddha, the Buddha has to step in and basically says, Manjushri, just tell him about your Buddha land. <laughs> and Manjushri is like, okay, I'll tell you about my Buddha land. And does in, indeed proceed to talk about what their, Manjushri proceeds to talk about what their Buddha land is gonna be like. <clears throat> and where we left off was after a description of the inconceivable nature of Manjushri's Buddha land, the Bodhisattvas start asking, will Manjushri's Buddha land be as, as good as Amitabha Buddha's Buddha land? And that's sort of the last section that we read. And it was the beautiful, uh, really hyperbolic comparison between Manjushri's Buddha land and this other Buddha's Buddha land and about all the, like taking a drop from the ocean and that's like Amitabha's Buddha land and the whole rest of the ocean, that's like Manjushri's Buddha land. So that's where we left this story. And then, unless there's any lingering questions from all of that, cool. So then what happens is, <clears throat> The Bodhisattva, powerful lion courage or voice of thunderous courage, asks the Buddha, world honored one, are there any 
other Tathagatas, any other Buddhas <clears throat> who previously mastered the array of virtues of the Tathagata Samanta Darshan. So Samanta Darshan is the name given for Manjushri in the future. So Lion Courage wants to know, <clears throat> are there any other Buddha lands in, from the past, or actually, will anybody in the future, or is there anybody right now who has a Buddha land as adorned as Samantha Darshan's Buddha land? <clears throat> and I, I mentioned this a, a few uh, many Sundays ago. This is where the sutra starts to it starts to play with tense, future tense, past tense. And what I mean is, is that it, it does this weird thing where it describes Manjushri in the future. And oh yeah, he will be called Samantha Darshan and his Buddha land will be like that. But then it does this thing by talking about like, are there any Buddha lands now as nice as that one? as if that one already exists, but it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist to the future, right? So my point is, is <clears throat> the sutra starts to play with when, when, when is all of this happening? Where is all of this happening? <clears throat> so has there ever been a Buddha land as good as this, as Manjushri's future one? Will there be one in the future? Is there anyone right now? And the Buddha says, <clears throat> noble one, there is. There is a Buddha realm called the highest aspiration located to the east of here, past Buddha lands equal to the grains of sand in the Ganges River. And there lives there a Tathagata, an arahat, a perfectly enlightened Buddha named fully illuminated oceanic king of many hundreds of virtues. <clears throat> that Buddha, that Tathagata, has a lifespan that is limitless. That Buddha is still alive and teaches the Dharma to an, in, to an immeasurably large assembly of bodhisattvas surrounding him and revering him. Noble one, the array of virtues that will emerge in the Tathagata Samanta Darshan's Buddha land and the array of virtues that is present now in the Buddha realm of that blessed Tathagata Arhat, perfectly enlightened Buddha, fully illuminated oceanic king of many hundreds of virtues are exactly the same with nothing different. Noble one, there are also four bodhisattvas who practice the same exact conduct as Manjushri Bodhisattva as they have donned the same inconceivable armor and are engaged in the same inconceivable activities. The arrays of virtues of the Buddha realms of those four bodhisattvas will also be just like this. <clears throat> All the bodhisattvas then said, world honored one, Please reveal the names of these four bodhisattvas. Please describe the locations of those bodhisattvas. Please describe the Buddha realm of the blessed Tathagata, fully, th that blessed Tathagata, fully illuminated oceanic king of many hundreds of virtues. Please describe that Tathagata and those bodhisattvas. I ask you this so that other bodhisattvas may also acquire such arrays of virtues in their Buddha lands. 
The Buddha answered, Noble one, since you ask, listen, and I will explain. The first bodhisattva is named Crest of Light, living in the East, in the Buddha realm of the blessed Tathagata, splendor without anguish. The second bodhisattva is named Superior Wisdom, living in the South, in the Buddha realm of the blessed Tathagata, victorious wisdom. The third bodhisattva is named Peaceful Senses and lives in the West, in the Buddha realm of the blessed Tathagata, massive insight. And the fourth bodhisattva, bodhisattva is named Intelligent Aspiration, living in the North, in the Buddha realm of the blessed Tathagata called Power. Then the Buddha displayed a miracle. This miracle was such that the Buddha realm of the blessed Tathagata, fully illuminated oceanic king of many hundreds of virtues, appeared. That blessed Tathagata was surrounded and revered by that assembly of bodhisattvas. The array of virtues of the Buddha realm was such that it had never see, been seen of or heard of before. It was unfathomable and had all of the finest features. All the features of that Buddha realm were as visible from this Buddha realm as a gooseberry would be in the palm of a person looking at it with normal vision. The blessed Tathagata, fully illuminated oceanic king of many hundreds of virtues, was sitting there in a usual posture, sitting 84,000 miles tall, like a mountain of gold from the Jambu River, dazzling, radiant, brilliantly beautiful. The Tathagata was surrounded and revered exclusively by bodhisattvas who were all 42,000 miles tall. He was seated on a lion throne under a tree of awakening, which was adorned with myriad arrays of, excellent, of excellence, manifesting trillions of emanations. All these emanations spread into trillions of worlds throughout the 10 directions, all preaching the Dharma. The Buddha then addressed the Bodhisattva assembly, asking, noble children, do you see the arrays of virtues and the abundant Bodhisattvas assembled in that Buddha realm? And 84 thousand bodhisattvas in the assembly then stood up, draped their shawls over one shoulder, and then with palms joined together, they said with a single voice, world honored one, we have seen it, and we will also train in the same type of conduct as Manjushri Bodhisattva. We will also manifest such a raise of virtues in our Buddha lands. And then the world honored one smiled. All right, let's pause there. Okay, anything come up for anybody from that miracle? Any thoughts about the miracle? Okay, let me, because we have time, let me give you a little bit more. <clears throat> so then the world honored one smiled and from his mouth streamed light in a variety of colors, blue, yellow, red, white, violet, crystal, and silver. The light rays 
illuminated infinite numbers of worlds and then returned, circled the Buddha three times and then disappeared into the crown of his head. Then out of nowhere, the Bodhisattva Maitreya, the future Buddha, then said to the Buddha, world honored one, what is the, what is the cause of your smile? Then the Buddha answered, Maitreya, when the array of virtues of this Buddha realm was revealed, 84,000 bodhisattvas developed the intention to manifest arrays of virtues in their Buddha realms that match the array of, Buddha, uh, the array of virtues in the Buddha realm of Manjushri. Maitreya. Out of the 84,000 bodhisattvas, there were 16 sublime beings who spoke motivated by pure intention. The arrays of virtues in their Buddha realms will match the array of virtues of Manjushri's Buddha realm. Though the array of virtues in the Buddha realms of the other bodhisattvas will not manifest that same way, they will also fully awaken to Anuttara Samyak Sambuddhi, unsurpassed perfect Buddhahood. The arrays of virtues in their Buddha realms will be such that they, that they match the array of virtues in the Sukhavati, the pure land of Amitabha Buddha. Maitreya, consider the preciousness of the pure motivation of bodhisattvas. Though the words they spoke were the same, the arrays of virtues of their Buddha realms will be different. And they, they will match the intentions of those bodhisattvas. Those with a lesser intention and those who merely speak out of just faith, they have formed a lesser intention. So it will only be after 60 trillion kalpas that they will escape samsara and perfect only five paramitas. Okay, so pause there. So one of the things that I want to point out, I kind of, I was trying to prepare us for this. So I was trying to point out that my feeling about it is that the miracle the Vikarvanya is in the story, meaning it's not a historical event, and this is a record of the historical event, that the, the actual miracle is in, I don't want to say in the telling of the story, it's in the story, but you, it requires telling the story for the miracle to sort of be, well, to appear in that sense. So what I'm getting at is, is that there's a really interesting form of what you would call recursion going on in this sutra. And what it is, is, is that there's a way in which, so I read this aloud and I described the, you know, this, this, what was the, that Buddha called that crazy name, right? This, um, I can't even find it. The, oh, the uh, fully illuminated oceanic king of many hundreds of virtues, right? What a mouthful of, for a Buddha, right? So the Tathagata, fully illuminated oceanic king of many hundreds of virtues. We have been told by the sutra, we've been told that the array of virtues of the Buddha land of that Buddha, oceanic king, right? that Buddha, we've been told that that Buddha land is exactly like the Buddha land of the future Manjushri. That's what it says. They're exactly alike. And then everybody was like, Ooh, we want to see, we want to see that, that Buddha land of the oceanic king of hundreds of, of virtues. And the Buddha performs a miracle in which he shows that Buddha land to the audience. And what it says is, is that 
there's, I mean, it's 84,000 or whatever, but the point is, is that there's a group, a group of bodhisattvas in the audience that saw the Buddha land. They like, they saw it. Not everybody saw it, but they saw it. And then out of that group of bodhisattvas that saw it, 16 of them like really saw it. And what I'm kind of pointing at is that the way that I understand that, the way that I read that is that there's a kind of miracle in the telling of this story. And there's some of you out there that saw it in that way. And if the good news, really good news for those of you who saw it in that way. And there's some of you out there that might be scratching your head, like saw what? I, I don't know what was there to see. And I would suggest that that's where the miracle is in that way. And so let me kind of uh, say something more about what I'm kind of getting at. I think that there's a way, and I, I've said this a long time ago, we, we modern people are so accustomed to reading that I don't think we fully appreciate the magic of, of the imagination, like the, the power of painting images in people's minds with words and having those words conjure imagery, imagery and images and all of that. There's a way in which I think uh, an older world, a more kind of ancient world, like where these sutras come from, I think the ability to use some symbols to create some words that then conjure images in one's mind is miraculous, is utterly miraculous. And we might not think it's anything special because we're kind of so used to being dazzled by our minds all the time in that way. And then especially with the advent of moving images, it, it's, there's a way in which the text, text-based imagery isn't as, it's nowhere near as dazzling as, you know, uh, 3D IMAX or whatever in that way. So we're us moderns are even further removed from kind of what a miracle it must have been like to either hear these things or read them and then have these images occur in your mind. So the, again, so I would point to this idea that, that that miracle of seeing this Buddha land of this person was sort of the, the only place that was going to happen is in this storytelling in that way. So questions, comments, answers, ideas about any of that. Yeah, no. Uh, toward the end there, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Toward the end there, I was getting I was sort of like wait which Buddha is talking like is it the Buddha that came from the other land or is it our Buddha and so that makes me think that, that another way to read this is that you know the the the, the mirror you know our Buddha and 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 <laughs> the assembly of, of bodhisattvas there is another miracle so that that's that's one thought and now uh... yeah and I'm, the other thought I'm having is I'm wondering if uh, going even a little, I don't know about this, but going even a little farther than what you described about the, the miracle of being able to um, hear a story and imagine a world, or hear a story and imagine anything, is sort of the miracle of being able to even know what other people are thinking or just the sort of miracle of communicating what's in our minds. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and if you add to that gnome, if you add to that a, a, a really acute sense of dependent origination, mm -hmm. 
that these the writers of these sutras really understood dependent origination and so really understood that what kind of what you were talking about in that in that way too that the 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 miracle of any kind of even language or discourse in that way yeah. totally yeah well and, and that that makes me think that the the and then you were talking earlier about imagination it makes me think about you know that if if we're also understanding you know the the thin line between imagination and reality then then it just all explodes <laughs> yeah and i do think that that's where a sutra like this is trying to push uh yeah. in in many ways the dialogue that's been going on has been pushing at those uh borders of conceptualization or yeah. Yeah. the idea of real not real yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let me mention another thing, um, just because I don't want it kind of hanging out there. It's a little, little odd. Um, so at the very end of this, you know, it's doing this interesting thing where it's talking about in the audience of the people who saw or heard about this, there were the, the, those that saw it, the, the, but there's only going to be 16 in that way that like really, really got it. And then it says this weird thing about how that it's a really interesting statement and the, the Chinese version is, it kind of reinforces an idea and it talks about how those, so those 16 bodhisattvas are solid, but there's also all those other bodhisattvas. It says, but then there's all these other people that they, you know, they're into it, but they have a lesser intention and they only spoke out of faith and were to presume not out of knowledge, but just out of faith. And it says that because of that, they have formed a inferior aspiration and it's going to take them 60 trillion years to escape samsara and then even when they do that they're only going to perfect five of the paramitas i just want you to know because i i, I may skip parts next week just because anyway it just rolls all into the uh, same idea but a funny thing starts to happen where it's sort of like the sutra starts talking about but you know, if there are people who do this, then they'll escape samsara after only like, you know, however, you know, 10 trillion kalpas or whatever. And, and, and then if there, and it keeps doing this until eventually it kind of lays out how to limit your time in samsara. And I just want you to know that it's another funny layer of the text that I don't think I'll talk about next week. So I wanted to kind of include it in this week. In that way. All right. Um, on that note, I think that's it for me. Unless there's any questions, comments, answers, or ideas, because that's about all I wanted to get to tonight. Um, Excuse me. Um, I was just wondering, um, what line are we on on the Tibetan uh, version? I think I got lost at some point there. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't mention that earlier. I'll tell you that I just ended on paragraph 1.276. Okay. Um, and Thank now that I, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also just because I'm looking at my notes now, just an interesting little thing about how all of a sudden Maitreya appears. I don't know if everybody caught that right. So this is the first we've heard from Maitreya, this whole sutra. And like all of a sudden out of nowhere, Maitreya pops in. And I just kind of, you know, wanted to mention that if, it, if you didn't know, Maitreya being the future Buddha. But if we are to understand all of this is happening allegorically, where they're not talking about like a savior figure that's coming in a thousand years or whatever. If we understand that Maitreya 
is, um, well, let me let me put it to you this way: how this is working allegorically, just to give you a little more background. So, in these sutras, what we have learned is that anytime the Buddha smiles, it's it 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 it, it heralds the prediction of enlightenment. The the this idea that uh oh somebody's getting enlightened soon. <laughs> it's this kind of funny idea. Um, it, it makes the Buddha smile when he realizes that people are going to achieve enlightenment soon. And so I want you to notice if you didn't notice, it was Maitreya that asked the Buddha about the smile. And Maitreya being the future Buddha sort of embodies this idea of future Buddhahood in that way. So it's just sort of the in it's a it's a deep deep layer to all of these sutras that if you read them allegorically and somebody like maitreya represents future enlightenment whereas as i mentioned before manju shri is like one of the most interesting allegorical figures because Manju Shri, being the bodhisattva of prajna, the bodhisattva of this wisdom, Manju Shri embodies emptiness, no self, like all of that. And so all of these, and, and I said this before when the bodhisattva um, thunderous lion courage, when he first starts asking Manju Shri, like, so when did you first? Uh, become a bodhisattva. When will you achieve Buddha, a Buddhahood? Allegorically speaking, the, the, the bodhisattva is asking emptiness. <laughs> emptiness. When did you, you know, first become a bodhisattva? When will you become a Buddha? And emptiness is sitting there going, <laughs> what? Who? Who's going to achieve enlightenment? Who is there to be here for you to be asking in that way? And so we just kind of get these different allegorical figures that it gets, it gets fun to read sutras when you read them that way. That's all I want to say tonight. <laughs> just encourage everybody to have fun reading sutras. I think that's my, my goal here. So, All right, everybody. Uh, that's going to be it. We will continue reading the sutra next week unless there's any... I just had one comment. I just was really struck by what you were talking about. I, I, you know, just thinking about how different it is when one's reading something or hearing something, how the mind's eye kind of naturally, you know, you it just happens. Like, you know, you start, I mean, I, I when I'm reading something, I'm sort of, if I stop, I realize that I'm like, there's images and stuff coming in my mind kind of as I'm reading a story, it's so different than like going and watching a movie right? mm. where, where the, the imagery is being interpreted for you. you sure. Know? So um, it's, there's just something very cool about doing it yourself. <laughs> so. Absolutely. And I, and I know that there's probably many, many readers in, in the audience that agree that are like, yeah, that's what's so fun about reading is that it just says, you know, it just says like uh, a, a woman got onto a plane and what she looked like and where the plane's going and all of that, that's all up to you. You're just given these little bit of details. But yeah, in a movie, you're just, you are shown this person getting onto a plane and, and you, you just accept it in that way. So yeah. it's a beautiful thing. Very cool. And, and then what, you know, Noam also is talking about, about language and communication and yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing. So. I agree. All right. On that note of amazement, that's going to be it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, mm -hmm. um, do you have, do you have any announcements? Um, I'm all out of announcements right now. Just tune in next week for more Dharma fun.